Hello and welcome to the Zero Waste Festival Focus on Food panel. Uh, I'm Alice in frames Zaslavsky. If I've not met you before, I write books, host TV shows, I present a whole bunch of stuff live, normally on stage, but hey, Zooming is pretty fun too. And I also help kids fall in love with veg uh, through something known as phenomenon, which I'll talk a little bit about soon. But before I continue, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm zooming in from the Boon Wurrung, um, people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I think that there has never been a better time to learn from them and their traditional practices. So a little bit about me and my learnings. Uh, before all of this food chat, I was the debt head of humanities at a top tier school and I loved talking about food in my classes. And the reason why mostly is because I love food, but also because I found that it was a really great way of engaging kids with whatever it was that I was teaching, whether it was history, geography, or even English through something as simple as a process writing activity through recipes, for example. Uh, but what I found is when I take them on school camps, I was taking year eights on camps who didn't even know how to dice an onion, let alone cook a meal for themselves. So when we came back to school, I thought, why not create an elective that I could encourage kids to learn about food and culture in a more practical, um, more, um, set kind of way but my heads of school said that I was a history English geography teacher I didn't have the skills and I probably wouldn't get the numbers so I went off and did a big chef at home course uh, at William Anglis uh, which is where the master chef auditions were taking place so when the course was over I heard that they were looking for people with personality who could cook and I figured why not audition my kids will see me on one episode and they'll want to do my elective so I'll get the numbers and I've got the experience Obviously, after that was done and dusted after six months of lockdown and finishing up just before finals week, almost a decade ago, I came back to school and my kids were so excited to see me and they saw me in a new light and I realized that I had an opportunity beyond just teaching 30 kids in a class at a time. I turned the living room into my classroom um, and a couple of years ago now, almost four years ago now, I was approached by uh, Port Innovation, who are the grower-owned not-for-profit research and development corporation that look after all of the growers of vegetables, fruits, seeds and nuts in Australia. And they were looking for a way to connect with kids and connect kids to fresh food and to um, particularly thinking about themselves as conscientious, conscious consumers of produce, which is something that I'm very passionate about. And we did a whole bunch of research and looked at what it is that was missing. And I knew that the thing that was missing was a food and culture elective in schools. So I got an opportunity to finally create something that I'd been thinking about for so long. And it's called Phenomenom. It's a series of springboard videos that are designed for teachers to use in class and parents to use at home if they're uh, remote learning. And it's also uh, got a podcast called Nomcast, which is pretty darn great if you haven't tuned in and we will soon be releasing more episodes of both of those things which is really really exciting and one of the focuses of the program is sustainability because as far as I'm concerned it's one thing to know how to cook for yourself um, how to understand food but on top of that it's important to recognize that we are part of a system of food and there's never a, a young enough time to see that and you see toddlers um, my I've got a 14 month old who loves picking rocket from our wicking bed and um, and I just see the excitement in her face when she she watches the seedlings grow from from nothing you know cropping up and and becoming this delicious peppery leaf that she connects with and then to think about you know well, what happens when that got, starts to get a little bit mushy um, what what else can we do with it and Where's our compost heap and all of those sorts of things. And I realized that we are in a very privileged position that we can have a garden, that we um, have the time to engage with her. Um, so what I think is most important and the thing that I hope that we can take from today is how we can check in with everybody and meet everybody where they are on this spectrum of understanding and capability and access and how we can all support each other and ourselves to be uh, thinking more sustainably and acting more sustainably as well uh, and moving towards a zero waste mindset and earth. 
So without any further ado, um, I will start to wrap up my little shtick. Um, I noticed I've got a little bit more time. I, I didn't realize I, I thought I'd rambled on for long enough, but um, I think um, I'm, I'm running through my brain to think what I can possibly impart as well. And I think that um, one thing that I've learned through Phenomenon, I know that a lot of people tuning in will ha probably have their own um, programs or projects uh, or products within this space. And one of the focuses of our project, in fact, a third of the funding, we've, we've had almost uh, $2 million of funding to date from government and industry, a third of that has gone towards research and consumer insights. Uh, so some of the takeaways that, that I've kind of kept close to my heart, the, the number one thing that I really want to impart on everybody is that we can feel it now. We are in the throes of a paradigm shift where people are recognizing that um, the systems that were in place um, were, are not working, um, were not working. So this is actually the perfect time to engage with people that may otherwise not have prioritized food or um, sustainability or climate change. So um, I think that the consumer is open and willing and ready. So why not grasp this opportunity and really thrust the world into this future thinking mindset? Obviously there will be a time we're in it at the moment where sustainability feels like it's gone out the window a little bit. You know, we've gone from hospitality businesses going plastic free and now you know in a post-covid hospitality space how do you do that when you have to use plastic straws or where you have to use um, rubber gloves or plastic gloves all the time so it's a very interesting complex time and i'm very much looking forward to experiencing and meeting all of the speakers that we will be engaging with today um, and we are going to kick things off very soon Okay, so welcome to our Focus on Food. It's incredibly exciting that we have three really amazing speakers today with us for our interview. We've got um, Mark from Save Our Soil, Miranda from Melbourne Farmers Market, and Hiro from uh, Kinfolk and Sibling Cafe. Um, so we're just gonna be talking about food and where we'll, um, yeah, just kind of look at the processes around food, around food waste and how um, we as a society can contribute in lots of different ways to support our growers, support our markets, and as well as our social enterprises. So I'm going to throw it over to Mark. Um, would you like to do a quick intro about you, who you are? We'd love to hear about uh, regenerative farming as well as biodynamics. So yeah, over to you, Mark. Okay. Um, you know my name, of course. My business is called Save Our Soil, and um, I was born into... Um, biodynamic farming, which I'll explain in a minute. My father started in 1965 um, under the uh, learning of Alex Podolinsky. And we, just to give you a, a bit of an idea of what the difference of that is to perhaps organic and conventional farming, would that be of value? Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Um, my father was a conventional farmer. So a conventional farmer is a person who would just uh, do things like everybody else does, I guess. And we would, uh, we had uh, dairy and sheep for a start off. And he would bring in fertilizer from, it, some of it would come from, you know, a long way away and be mined out of rock and then treated with petrochemicals to make it water soluble. So it was mainly superphosphate. And um, in the latter years, they've used nitrogen and things like that. But to fertilize our soil, they would um, spread that in powder form over the acreage and then water that in and then the grass would grow longer and they would get more production so but the, the downside of that is the animals became sick and then you would have to drench them or give them some sort of spray for lice or, or things like that and my father started to get problems with that and the, what eventually happened is the water the irrigation water because we're in an irrigation district here wouldn't go into the soil and he couldn't water his soil properly so and it would go dry within a few days so he started then to probably the best way to explain organics he moved into a period of about two years where he didn't use any chemicals and he didn't use any superphosphate or nitrogen fertilizer and stopped all the drenches and things like that so that's basically organic and then what he did instead of he he, he uh 
instead of bringing in the phosphate and the minerals, oh sorry, the phosphate and the nitrogen, he brought in compost, organic matter, and he would bring in minerals that are non-chemical. So you're still bringing in a lot of tonnage of different things to make the grass grow. So he did that for about two years and our, our water problem where it wasn't penetrating the soil was still happening. We weren't fixing that. So he went a bit, one step further and looked into biodynamics. Now the difference with biodynamics is we mainly um, concentrate on the soil biology and we make in biodynamics they make a series of what they call preparations which for those people who are not farmers and not bd or biodynamic it's really like a soil probiotic so we all take probiotics for our guts they're a little tiny capsule we put them in our stomach and it makes everything balanced and nice and it works much better um, we have a preparation called 500 which we spray it on the soil and it's made from cow manure and a cow horn you've probably all heard that story but it's basically like a probiotic for soil we add about um, a, an ounce and a quarter per acre and that's there's millions of microbes in there and they're dropped every inch or so on the soil and then they bury in the soil make holes and then they break down all the organic matter all the root systems all the leaf all the manure and they turn that into a thing called humus which is basically like compost in the soil if you like for those people who don't know what the humus is. So um, by doing that, after two years, he his water started penetrating the soil again. So with biodynamics, you're not bringing in all those things. We're basically growing cover crops on the property. So that is your organic banner. And then your preparations are your biology. So the biology breaks down the organic matter, turns it into humus or compost, and it's all done within the soil. So it's a very efficient system. So it's more a circular system in that we're not bringing in things, everything's made on the farm. We had a dairy farm at the time, so we made a lot of compost, but as a veggie farmer, I don't have the cows, so I don't, I don't make the compost. Maybe perhaps we could kind of just cover what cover crops are for people who might not know. What's sure. the point of having it? What is a cover crop and why you would, you know, um, spend time and energy into that? So a cover crop, uh, we have our cash crops are the things that we put in the soil, grow, take off and then sell for money. That might be watermelons or, or something like that. In a dairy farmer situation, he would grow um, hay or grass for the cows to eat to make milk. So what we do is um, in the meantime, we, uh, when the soil's resting or we can, we've got a bit of time for it to, to repair or regenerate, we grow a crop purely just to get the root systems down deep and get a lot of organic matter on the top. And then we slash the top, dig that into the soil. And basically that's there for the microbes to eat and to, and to humus or compost. So it's a non-paid a non -paid crop almost, just a, a regenerative crop. But it pays your soil, basically. It's the yes. investment, isn't it? Yes, the it's an investment in your soil, yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, I guess it'd be a good segue here to kind of look at, um, you know, with your cash crop, like how much goes to the farmer's market, you know, how much does it go out to, uh, you know, how much do you sell and how much kind of what happens to the rest of it? Well, I've got a quite a large um, veggie farm. I have 50 acres. My father since retired from dairy farming, so we, we took over uh, 50 acres over the back and I always wanted to do veggies and do them direct as we are with the farmer's markets. And so, I only grow about two and a half acres per season. So I grow five acres for the total year. And then I have like 40 acres just resting and growing pasture. So in that time, especially over the winter and spring, it's growing long grass and the roots are digging deep into the soil. And then I'm slashing that down and then turning that into humus by spraying it with our prepared 500 microbes. So only five acres is being used for cash crops. And then once that's finished, I, I usually do two veggie crops in that five acres. And then it's turned back to pasture, which is clover and all those perennial grasses that grow naturally. So it's about um, 10%. So, but that's not a very good example. I've got lots of land and look, if I had, uh, if I was doing four markets at the farmer's markets, I would probably double that. You know what I mean? There's plenty of room there for expansion. Yeah. And what's the importance, I guess, of like resting, having the spaces to rest as well? Sorry? Um, so why would you, as a farmer, choose to have some spaces where you're resting, you're not constantly growing? I guess that's um, the point of difference. Yeah, just to build up those humus levels. Um, 
because we're relying on nature to build the humus and we're not bringing something in the gate. So uh, we like our you know, carbon levels to be up quite high and that grows our crop for us. So um, by leaving, the longer I leave it, the more carbon I build in the soil and the more carbon's there, the easier the veggies grow basically. Cool. I think it's a great time to throw over to Miranda to talk about Melbourne Farmers Market and how you support growers and producers. And um, yeah, we'd love to hear a bit about what Melbourne Farmers Market does. Yeah, it's great to be here and, and have a chat because I think it puts uh, all our work into fantastic um, context that it's, it's so interlinked. Um, and that's really important that um, a message, we probably understand it um, all because we're immersed in it, but it's, um, it's getting it out to the industry and the community that, um, so that we all understand the, the linkage. Um, so the Melbourne Farmers Markets is, um, uh, you know, one of those ideas that started on my kitchen table now um, nearly 20 years ago. And it was because I had a background as a, a chef and a caterer um, and I couldn't, what, what struck me was that I couldn't buy from small growers uh, or direct from any growers for that matter. Everything was through a distributor and it was someone sort of, you know, removed from the process, um, didn't necessarily understand what they were doing. There were, there were challenges, it wasn't a perfect system anyway, but for a small business it was really hard to um, create a, a kind of, I was looking to, what I think was instinctive to me, but also a point of difference rather than just being the run of the mill uh, like everyone else. Um, and then through, you know, travel and, and other work and work as a food journalist, I had the same experience um, of this disconnect between, between our, our food and, and its growers and ourselves as consumers, whether we're in the industry or whether we're, as we all do, generally, um, you know, several times a day, if we're fortunate enough. Uh, and eventually, the, through circumstance with the Collingwood Children's Farm um, and, a, and a residential development that, that threatened to close it down um, in the early 2000s, I thought this is the time and the place to start a market and, and, and create an opportunity where the growers themselves would have the chance to tell their story, educate, provide um, obviously fresh fresh produce, but um, just that very uh, connection between people via food, you know, has the opportunity for all sorts of other um, uh, subjects and issues and, and relationships to develop as well. And as, as Mark says, it's, you know, something as something like biodynamics um, it's it's not necessarily what gets out to the public um, through we, we would otherwise be relying on second and third hand information if at all if it gets out there at all who better to talk about it than the people who um, who champion it and who live and breathe and and bring the very produce that thinks for itself um, we've got to get on to sweet potatoes obviously in a, in a little while um, but you know we had Mark's sweet potatoes again last night and there's there's a there's a now I can't I can't I can't say it's particularly so but the the uh, intensity the richness of the flavor the, the, the color the texture everything that is uh, about the sweet potatoes that Mark's bringing to market at the moment um, are unlike anything else you know around and presumably I would presume that's down to the the methodology and the philosophy and the growing techniques of, of biodynamics and it certainly kind of seems to speak for itself in its in the flavor and also the, the nutrient value also you know things and when, when we get around to talking about ways um, I think there's a it's a kind of um, it's a subtle thing, but it's really significant, and that is the, the sort of value of the whole um, product, you know, all of those things. It's, there's more nutrient density. Uh, it goes so much further in, in a kind of um, 
nourishing us in all sorts of ways. And, and it's obviously an incredible um, value for money to get all of that when otherwise what you might be getting is, is sort of water or, you know, some sort of um, um, padding that, you know, the food, the food uh, industry is very good at adding. Yeah, definitely. I can um, say that as a market attendee, I love being able to talk to the growers and find out the story to see what's in season and to kind of get some advice like, oh, how would I use this? Or And also to kind of have that connection with food and see where it comes from, who's grown it. Um, you know, apart from growing yeah. it yourself, this is like that next step, the next best thing. Which I That's right. Well. And, I, and I think, you know, what's interesting at the moment when a lot of people are um, have a different kind of time at their, at their disposal. People are planting gardens, which is fabulous in itself. It's great in itself that they feed, they, they may or may, um, you know, feed themselves. But it's also so important that they're realising how much hard work it is to produce a crop um, that's perfect, you know, by uh, sort of by our consumer standards, mm. and not just not just once, over and over and over again, um, to you know, have to actually have an income, a viable business income, uh, and look after, have any consciousness of of um, looking after um, you know soil and the planet and 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 what nourishes us, uh, you know, marks marks. Um, dedication to that is is extraordinary and um yeah, yeah. he's he's probably he's such an unusual example but then there are so many degrees of that down to you know the, the, the worst case scenario where we where we put such pressure on the um on our land um mm. but you know that's why we need to get the information out yeah, absolutely definitely like champions like mark who um, really showcase um, what he does like through your TikTok, through instagram posts it i i've loved following the journey of my food like going oh yeah those are the sweet potatoes i remember when mark you know kind of like along the journey of my food and kind of like oh now i've got it in my hands and i can go home and i cook it and yeah just like knowing this journey and the story of our food uh, just brings so much richness and connection to it not to mention you know all the nutrients and benefits from it um i guess i'd like to tap in right now and look at the other side as you were talking about the food that doesn't look perfect um and kind of you know what do we do with that and i know melbourne farmers market does some incredible things and you know as well as um what kinfolk does as well so miranda if you want to kind of jump into that and talk about moving yeah forward. well it's i mean as a <sighs> You know, as a people, we need to, you know, it's increasingly um, important that we understand the reality of the waste in the food system or the, and the potential and the opportunity, therefore, that we have to, to change that. And not just in the, I mean, there's, there's both the ingredient itself, but the packaging and the, um, and our processing of, of things and, um, yeah, our, our attitude to, to how we, you know, the full, the full context. Um, I think the markets. What what I hope, and it's it's not you know it's this isn't a this isn't a perfect model where mm. there are lots of things. I <laughs> many many areas of room for improvement. Um, if only I could get stuck into them all. But one of them is that I think, which is great, is that there's a conversation over the over the trestle table of why something is um, you know looking a bit wonky or. Um, I mean, imagine if every sweet potato that Mark sold had to be in in perfect shape without a, a ding or a or a snap yes. or a cut or I mean, it, it, you know, understanding the obvious thing and that a that a, a harrow or something has gone through to lift the potatoes. So we yeah it's likely that they're going to get you know the they're reality is they're good. just going to get knocked about a bit. So it doesn't make them they don't keep any worse they don't. Um, you know they don't taste any different um so why would we why in the purest sense would we think it's unsaleable or inedible it's just that this the the, the levels of um the number of times it changes hands mm -hmm. it sort of has the opportunity to go oh no i don't know about that oh you know what am i paying? all those things from um and i think the markets provide an opportunity for people to talk about those things um, and they have the choice you know, with Mark as well about that and kind of like, you know, what are some of these sort of things that happen that, you know, 
how does it affect your produce? I know we were having a bit of a conversation at the market um, yesterday. So what are some things that does affect um, the end product? Um, uh, there's, there's so many, many things. But yeah, just to kind of get people's ideas around like, you know, it's so hard to grow something perfect. And if you've grown it yourself, you know how hard it is to get a perfect looking shape or perfect colored and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, Mark, can you highlight some of the things that can, you know, influence and impact our food appearance wise? Yeah. Well, one of the reasons I started with Melbourne Farmers was that we were growing cherry tomatoes and we were getting about $4 a punnet for certified organic or biodynamic at the time. And um, then next week, the uh, all the Queensland cherry tomatoes came down from the market and we were flooded with cherry tomatoes. And all of a sudden it went from $4 to $2.50 and that dropped under production. And that used to just drive me nuts. One minute you're making money, the next minute you're not. So I always wanted to be in control of my market and say, well, this is what I need, you know, for my produce. And at Melbourne Farmers Markets, we could get five and still the retailers would charge six or seven and we and the customer and I both win, you know, and that's, that's one of the major things because it means the difference between uh, surviving and not. Without Miranda, I don't think I'd be doing farming. So it's that important. Um, and then the other thing is that all those zucchinis that are a little bit big and a little bit marked or whatever, like I can just nick, nick a zucchini last week with the knife and I'll leave a little scar and I couldn't send that to market normally. So I reckon that I would lose 30 to 50% of my production if I didn't have the farmer's markets to go to because I can offer those slightly damaged or slightly you know, de defaced um, products for less money and the customer again wins, they get a cheaper product, I get a sale and we're both happy. Um, but also uh, with the sweet potatoes, they're just crazy shapes and sizes. Miranda saw some of them yeah. in the seconds. And we just run ripper marks right next to them and then we lift them out of the ground as carefully as we can. But there's always breaks or there's ones that are wiggly and people don't want to touch because they can't get the peel around them. Again, I would lose about 50% of uh, sales just because uh, the farmers markets will allow me to, here, you've got this product for $7 a kilo and you've got the same product with a little bit different shape or size for $4 and that works really, really well. So it makes the difference between me actually making a living out of this and not. So it's very, very important. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Um, we might go back to Miranda so we can kind of chat about that next phase of what happens with um, that sort of produce that might be imperfect. We've sold as much as we can at the market, but then there's still some left over and yeah. Yeah, well, well, sadly, sadly, I mean, we're the farmers markets and, and all um, of the models of direct sales um, are such a small percentage of the, of food that goes through our local um, industry. Uh, you know, we we can't um, we can't capture anything like we need to. But if we, I think you know, our belief is that we've got to keep trying and exploring these ways to do it, even if they're tiny examples because then at least you've got the, um, the we need to trade on the success stories and 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 show people really rather than just having the theory that that we can do something we can't no doubt it's not a hundred percent but you know we can we can do a hell of a lot better than we are now but just generally in the system um, and and having you've got to have a customer so you've got to you know what what I think my connection to the other end of the industry, um, always in the back of my mind, is who is it in the industry who would be receptive to this? And that's what we're trying to do here at Alfington is provide those um, opportunities for, um, you know, to be able to store something and able to keep it and able to move it on and show someone or do or just connect the, the dots, put, the, put people together, um, find places where they can do things together um you know all about collaboration yeah so um alfington you've got the melbourne food hub um you've got lots of different things so um can you tell us a bit more about um we were chatting about um, moving feasts and as well as the produce that goes to kinfolk and yeah, yeah. 
Well, that's uh, you know, Hero is one of one of those um, great examples of someone who's incredibly receptive and understands that you know. Even when Mark was talking, I was thinking, um, you know, well, why why peel the sweet potato? You don't, you know, who needs to? You know, it's so fresh. It's so this. You know, this is the attitude that people like Hero in the food in the, at the um, at the public end of of the industry are so um, critical for being able to tell the story, you know, to, to a larger group um, of people. And uh, and Moving Feast is, is one of those um, ways we can do it. It's unusual because it's um, born as a result of the COVID virus, um, coronavirus, but uh, it's it's certainly it's another one of those examples that we can, if we just try things, there are great outcomes. Yeah, if you can kind of give a bit of like, what's the mission of Moving Feast and what does Moving Feast do exactly? Moving Feast is um, the, the brainchild of uh, Rebecca Scott, the CEO of Street, uh, a wonderful organisation, social enterprise themselves, who um, uh, whose objective and work is in hospitality, using hospitality as a as a platform for for training, um, support, and job readiness of young people who who have uh, barriers to uh, employment and life's challenges. Um, Street operate here every week at the at our market, and we've had a long connection with them in in various ways um, in the social enterprise sector, of which Kinfolk is another um, fantastic organisation, and involved um, with uh, others like um, cultivating community series, um, fruit to work, uh, and um, a number of others who I feel bad about not being able to. From the list, we can put a list. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the, the, the thinking behind it is that in in this crisis of health crisis, that um, those of us who have a roof over our head or, or can afford to um, change and adapt and look after ourselves and hopefully our neighbours and our families, that's all very well for us. But what about vulnerable people? Um, and how do we? How do we ensure that they are they're looked after um, with um, nutritious food, simple nutritious, ready to eat food, um, to that's appropriate for their circumstances and for their culture. Um, and the great thing about social enterprise, of course, and this collaboration is that that it's identifying people throughout that process from beginning to end. And so much of the restaurant and hospitality world has been decimated by this as have so many growers and um, because they don't have customers. So what was recognised that let's let's do something different and not just do um, emergency food relief as might have been seen before by the by the big um, organisations who do incredible work, but let's make sure that we're supporting small the producers and the small businesses and, and social enterprises in the in the production and the people at the receiving end. Um, so we're working together with um, I'm buying I'm the I'm the sort of buyer um, and we have um, thanks to the generosity of the RACV Foundation and a number of other philanthropists I'm buying um, uh, produce at the prices that the um, that the farmers set um, which is you know they're generous they're selling me a wholesale rate um, but we're but I'm not setting that rate they are. And then it comes in and gets supplied to a number of restaurant kitchens who are then preparing the, the food to be distributed. Okay, great. It's a great time to kind of get Hero into this conversation. Um, so Hero, you've got um, a great experience in zero waste restaurants when you were working at Salah by Yos, And right now you're the head chef at Kinfolk. Uh, we'd love to hear about Kinfolk's and Sibling Cafe and um, yeah, to kind of learn more about the social enterprise there as well as your um, what you do there. Thanks, Emily. Hi, um, my name is Hiro. Um, I have been working at Kinfolk as a chef uh, past six years, and it's been a great journey. Um, as of today, May 25th, um, Kinfolk turned into 10 years old, uh, which is great. Um, 
yeah, we would like to celebrate, but I'm not sure how to do it. <laughs> um, so Kimfolk um, is a social enterprise company um, which has um, charity partners. Um, they are uh, Kathy Fuman Foundation, uh, which is a foundation to support uh, indigenous students and Asylum Seek Resource Center. Um, we go through approximately 100 volunteers annually and it's been a really great opportunity for me to learn from them and also um, this volunteer program is such a great cause because uh, there are so many people who are struggling to find um, working experience and also would like to get more social uh, interaction with others. So um, I can't explain how amazing um, what Kimfolk does. Um, yeah, as of um, being part of Moving Feast and trying to save uh, produce wastage is um, quite a learning process and challenging for me. Um, um, at Kimfolk, we are producing um, soup as a relief meal, um, but I think um, it's probably the best way to save uh, wastage and it's one of the best way to uh, save the nutritional part, um, which is uh, produce skins. Um, vegetable skins are quite often wasted and uh, sadly, but I, I think, well, supplies people know probably much better, but um, that's where all the nutritions are. So, um, yeah, um, where I come from, for instance, um, Japan, uh, we never waste pumpkin skin because it gives a really nice co color contrast on the dish and um, pumpkin skin has amazing um, nutrition. So, yeah. Um, well, at Sibling, uh, we are uh, using uh, one of um, amazing uh, vegetable supplies products. Um, it's called uh, Days Walk Farm. And if you are interested um, to try um, and to find out how good uh, local produce items are, um, please uh, come to Sibling website and check out uh, Fresh Produce Box. Um, that's one of the um, greatest items we have. Um, so, um, yeah. Well, um, I guess um, that's about it from me. Thanks so much, Emily. Just um, kind of coming through the full circle of um, where it's come from the farmer, from Mark, through Miranda, through Melbourne Farmers Market, and to social enterprises like um, Kinfolk Cafe, who are doing an incredible job. Um, it's really kind of like rethinking of um, our food systems, really. Um, yeah. So I just guess, does anyone have a last sort of remark they'd like to share about sort of like this shift in rethinking food systems that we as a society really need to kind of consider to kind of support um, everyone in our food system? Um, I'll add something. Um, I'd, I'd just like to say that the model that we have um, is just evolving all the time. I went into it and there was a couple other people went into it at the same time and they sort of said, oh, I've done the numbers and it won't work. and I, I'm pretty sure Miranda will agree with this that um, every day and every week we just try and improve a little bit more and we see more customers come, we see farmers come and go, uh, we see systems evolve and then get erased and and I heard Wendell Berry say something that you know in order for us to have a, re a revolution or re-evolution of the, the farming system in order to save our soil and save our planet we just have to be patient and just work through these matters bit by bit and I just wanted to thank Miranda and also my customers for coming every week and just you know dealing with all the little issues and making little uh, mistakes and then fixing them and 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 it's really changed dramatically in the last 10 years I've been there doing since 2009 and just to I used to uh, on a bad day I would do you know a couple hundred bucks and and 
and a, a great day would might be a thousand for example now a bad day is a thousand you know so um it has really changed immensely i used to worry about buying a 400 dollar set of scales and now it's like a big van i have to worry about buying so all i want to say <laughs> is that it, it just does evolve and it does get better and i, I want to thank everybody for just putting up with us and together we'll move through this whole because i believe that our food system is not very working very well for our environment and for our planet at the moment and I feel that the farmers markets has that potential to really change things. Yeah, I think so. I couldn't agree more, Mark. And um, you know, but we we couldn't um, we couldn't be part of this this puzzle without such incredible um, growers in in Victoria who really. Um, um, you know, it's, it's, we're so fortunate. This incredible depth and breadth of of people and produce and and things and and I um, continually and and I, I can't not be energised by the possibilities and the and and being op um, optimistic about this because there is such opportunity um, and now with this great health challenge on top of us it's it's given us a, a fantastic chance to to really rethink things and and understand better what what matters and what works um, and I I am completely convinced that that the small scale plays a very big part in in it and I'm very proud that that our farmers markets are you know aren't just part of that puzzle um, but we can we can all uh, we all play a part yeah absolutely it's definitely um, incredible to see the breadth of kind of the dedication, the passion that our farmers, you know, the persistence that they have to go through with the weather, with, you know, it's getting more dramatic and, um, you know, all that that they have to go through, it's incredibly challenging, but obviously they're very passionate and driven people like Mark and really championing um, biodynamics and just showing the evidence and through, through anything, it's that learning and growing as you, you know, mistakes are, you know you fall forward from them you, you kind of learn from yeah. them and um being able to be that resilient building that resilience as well is incredible so thanks to mark and thank you to all our amazing farmers and growers out there um we you know thank you for putting amazing food on our plate that's nutritious that's um you know enabling us to be our better selves as well and to people like miranda who had a, an idea over a bench table and has <laughs> created this incredible network of you know pulling pulling um, farmers and producers together to consumers so then we can have that connection we have that relationship with our food and we build that appreciation and gratitude um to our growers to our farmers but also towards our food and understanding like that process that goes into it and so thank you miranda and to your melbourne farmers market team you guys are incredible you know rain <laughs> hell and shine same with the farmers you know growers you guys are out there uh it's incredible like when it's raining i'm like i'm definitely getting out there because i know it might you know some people are like oh it's raining but it's like this is the time we need to go out there and support um and also to our amazing social enterprises like giving opportunity for people that uh have you know they didn't choose this life but providing those opportunities for people to grow and to believe in people um is just absolutely amazing what you do um bringing on board so many volunteers um also through this really difficult time like volunteering your time it's incredible seeing the response that sibling has done with you know having veggie boxes and then growing to kind of like um, supporting people and then building it up so that they could get all their team, you know, get a whole bunch of, um, you know, making sure that people continue to be employed, but also delivering amazing food. So con again, connecting in a different way um, and the delivery system. And yeah, it's just been incredible to see kinfolk and sibling, um, you know, be innovative throughout the system as well um, through our challenges. So Thank you so much. Um, Hero is also an incredible home cooking champion. Uh, I've loved following his uh, home Instagram. Um, we'll provide that link if you're um, interested in following that. Um, and being able to see that food from the farmer's market that he's used 
into these incredible dishes at home, mm. in, you know, just like a usual normal kitchen, um, has been really inspiring. And also um, to see kind of like the parts that you might not usually use and how Hero has been extremely, you know, um, open-minded and really creative in um, championing those things too. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you, Hero, for your time today. I hope everyone's really enjoyed uh, our conversation. And if you'd like to find out more, we will be sending everyone um, a little follow-up uh, of resources and actions. So you can um, get in touch, go support your farmers and your growers, go and support the incredible um, social enterprises out there that are doing incredible work. And thank you so much for being part of the festival. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Em. No Thank worries. You. Thank you. Bye now.